Hey, it's Mike here, and today, insects, finally, we're gonna be talking about them as a proposed solution to world hunger and food insecurity, as well as looking at the health claims of the industry that is growing. And finally, looking at the biology of various insects to you know, ask the question, can they feel pain? Do they suffer? Are they sentient, etc.? So let's just grass hop right into it here because we have a lot of quite recent news articles painting insects as the solution with how insects could help save the planet type articles popping up here and there. One Time Magazine article even refers to them as a six-legged solution to world hunger. And so of course we need to look at that growing insect industry, but I just have to mention that this is nothing new. Insects have of course been eaten by a ton of cultures across the world for centuries. But particular species have taken center stage here with crickets and cricket flower going pretty much mainstream with mealworms as a close second. And like animals that we already eat, we've taken some pretty major steps to distance ourselves from the whole animal that we're actually eating. In this case, we're putting things like cricket flour into breads and protein powders or protein bars and pastas. In terms of feeding the world, especially in the face of climate change, there are some pretty dramatic claims. And yeah, I understand that the land usage is going to be a bit lower for tiny little bugs, but some of the environmental claims are kind of questionable. Here's one. From The Guardian, quote, did you know crickets emit less than 0.1% of the greenhouse gas emissions of cows to produce the same amount of protein? Now there's no doubt that they are more environmentally friendly than cow meat, AKA beef but we have to investigate this claim because it is incredibly dramatic. And this is the 2010 plus one study that the claim seems to trace back to. And it looked directly at emissions from the animals themselves. You know, they were really interested in looking at the feed conversion ratio or how much of that feed turns into the animal by studying respiration and metabolism and how much methane they're breathing out, etc. So it's no surprise that there was a wild difference between ruminants like cows that burp up a bunch of methane versus crickets. And they even say, quote, a complete life cycle analysis for species of edible insects is lacking at this point in time. So we're not talking about emissions to grow feed, which of course is the main input. Also fun little detail of note here, there actually was a beetle that did emit you know, a comparable amount of methane to cows, which is pretty crazy. But we can look to newer studies that actually did life cycle assessments like this 2021 out of the UK, which looked at things like feed and the amount of energy that is used in a production facility, et cetera, and totals that up to around 20 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of insect body. And while there are a lot of different variables here that could get different numbers in different areas of the world, et cetera, just applying that to a chart that looks at various foods like this one from our world in data. Now that's right up there with cheese, quite high up on the chart. I do believe it likely could be done better due to the more efficient feed conversion ratio, but still you're not gonna be able to compete with plants when you have to feed these animals plants. The only way you can somewhat get around that is if you are able to find a stream of waste that you can then feed these bugs. However, that leads to its own potential health concerns, which we'll get into in this next section we're gonna cover, which is just just the health aspect of eating insects. We will learn about bug nervous systems and all of that in a second here. But yeah, looking at the health, there have been many claims just how they're really healthy. They're totally chock full of vitamins, etc. They do have B12 and protein and all of those things. However, even as one supplier of cricket flour mentions, it is high in cholesterol. We're talking about around 500 milligrams of cholesterol per 100 grams. 100 grams of eggs gets you 370. You know, maybe you're not eating as much dry powder as eggs in terms of the weight, but still, this is really high. And as industries do, the cricket industry, I can't believe I'm even saying that, the cricket industry has already put out material denying the negative effects of cholesterol, saying you need cholesterol, and all those other claims that I have responded to in detail in previous videos. Also, we have this study that did a pretty in-depth comparison of various insect species to various types of animal meat that are already eaten. And it looks like the saturated fat content of insects is generally on par you know, with animal meats. So yeah, also a high source, not good. And of course, I just need to mention that saturated fat raises cholesterol, in particular LDL or bad cholesterol is causally linked to atherosclerosis. 
So not good in this department. And as for feeding them waste, depending on the stream of waste that you have, you're potentially at risk for bioaccumulating various toxins and heavy metals from this paper. The heavy metals lead, arsenic, mercury, and cadmium can accumulate, you know, in the context of insects for food. So the waste stream has to really be pure enough here to be healthy. And then that can of course completely change the economic equation, whether or not it's viable. And of course we have to at least briefly cover the infectious disease risks. The first one that comes to mind here is bacteria. We have a lot of species like staph and strep and on and on that potentially could endanger humans. And as this study says, moving to viruses, quote, some virus Viruses could pose a risk to human and animal health where insects are used for food and feed. So we have viruses like hepatitis and noroviruses, and heck, maybe there will even be some fungal infections like that cordyceps mind control. Could farming insects and the interaction between insects and humans increasing lead to that same fungi that takes ants and zombie mind controls them to walk up to a high point and then have their head explode and release spores that lead to human infection? Could this turn into a Last of Us situation? Thankfully, it appears we're too biologically different for that to be happening anytime soon at all. However, I can't help but think if we made this a major part of the food supply and over time had a lot more insect-human interaction where there could be room for evolution, who knows? But to be fair, uh, experts say this is absolutely not a real concern. Now let's learn about the insect nervous system a little bit and really ask the question, are they capable of feeling pain and really capable of suffering? What do we know about this so far? Because the common view on insects is that they probably aren't suffering. You might as well just swat them, kill them, who gives a crap? But we need to investigate this and the claim that oyster eaters make is that, oh, they don't even have a central nervous system, so don't worry about it. I don't want to eat oysters anyway, but in this case, insects do have a central nervous system and their nervous system has been described as advanced. Starting with their ability to sense, they even have some sensing abilities which are shocking and certainly stronger than our own. Listen to this. Some can even sense heat cues from a distance. For example, fire chaser beetles in the genus Melanophila lay eggs in freshly burned trees that they sense with sensory organs on their legs. These receptors can detect infrared radiation produced by hot objects from up to 130 kilometers away. It's almost as far away as I can smell vegan desserts, so better luck next time, bugs. But looking at a diagram of their nervous system, of course, it's going to vary by species here, but you can see that they have of course, a brain, and then they have that central nerve cord, which spreads throughout the body, very similar to us. The difference is, and this is interesting, because they don't have a spine, they're invertebrates, not vertebrates like us, their main nerve cord actually goes along its belly instead of their back. Interesting stuff. So maybe when those little beetles get stuck on their back, they're just trying to be more like us with their nervous system switched where our, I, I was a stretch, I'll keep going. Within the central nervous system, the nerve cells are bundled into interconnected masses of neurons known as ganglia. These neural bundles, located along the length of the nerve cord, are joined by connectives, giving the insect's central nervous system a distinctive ladder. And their brain is sort of T-shaped, unlike ours. While an insect can do a lot with just its local ganglia, the brain is still crucial for its survival. An insect's brain lets it perceive the world through sight and smell. It also chooses suitable mates, remembers locations of food sources and hives, regulates communication, and even coordinates navigation over huge distances. And this is all quite interesting because they evolved this independently from a common ancestor worm from like hundreds of millions of years ago that we share. And now we have to get to the massive debate really on whether or not insects are feeling pain from this paper. Insect behavior toward injuries has been likened to robots and various scholars have denied the existence of pain in insects. So yeah, they're just robots that feel nothing. Well, well, that is being challenged and it has really been challenged for a while, which brings me to a quote that I had to share, which is, quote, I'm sure that insects can feel pain. The quote is not as interesting as it being said by Vincent Wigglesworth, entomologist and biology professor. I mean, what is this, Hogwarts? Has anybody else been playing Hogwarts Legacy? I have. 
There's never been a better name for somebody who studies bugs. Anyway, I can't help but think of that sort of budding psychopath child dripping hot wax on ants, that classic scene where those ants are kind of writhing clearly in some type of agony, which would lead me to believe that they're capable of suffering. They're at least sensing something, and I also can't help but wonder if insects were larger and on more human of a scale, like if bumblebees were the size of dogs or even cars, would we be like, oh, look at these magnificent, complex creatures. But their eyes are so intricate and they have all of these limbs and the ability to feel just like us. And I do have to say in the Carboniferous period, when there was more carbon and things were going bigger, there was a dragonfly with a 28 inch wingspan. You learn something every day. You already knew that. So we have to wonder how much are they suffering when they are hurt or is it just a reaction? And we can't ask them, but we can study them. And thankfully we have some more recent investigations like this 2020 review titled, Can Insects Feel Pain? Which did actually do it in the context of ethical implications for farming insects, among other things. They looked at six different orders or types of insects, and they used a sentience scale for pain, which is a little indirect, but we'll take it. And the results were your favorite insects, mosquitoes and flies, satisfied six out of eight of that sentience criteria. They say that is strong evidence for pain, and then beetles, moths, and butterflies satisfied three to four out of eight, which they say is substantial evidence for pain. And interestingly, they said that despite that, none of the insects actually demonstrated proof of failing any of those. So three to four doesn't mean only three to four, it just means at least three to four of those criteria. So we need more studies. And some of those same researchers actually did some more mechanistic studies like this one. And they say, quote, we argue that insects most likely have central nervous control over nociception, which by the way, is defined as the perception of a painful or injurious stimuli. So being able to perceive their own injury based on behavioral, molecular, and anatomical neuroscience evidence, such control is consistent with the existence of pain experience. They go on to say that mammalian researchers quantify pain through ways that have also been demonstrated in insects, which supports the idea of pain in insects. For example, insects show reduced attraction to appetitive stimuli if they have also experienced nociceptive stimuli. Again, that injury response. Further recent evidence demonstrating sentience linked cognitive abilities in some insects supports this idea, as well as studies indicating pain perception in other invertebrates. They go as far as to say that, quote, insect behavior has often been viewed as governed largely by instinct, a view which is no longer tenable given what we now know about advanced cognition and emotion-like states in insects. So I'm gonna be honest, I'm surprised by how much evidence there is supporting insects' ability to suffer. Part of me was like, I know I've probably killed a lot of insects throughout my life, you know, whether it's swatting mosquitoes or et cetera, and wanted to feel less guilty about it. But you know, vegans that I've known who are like, I'll let this mosquito bite me as long as there isn't dengue fever in the area. I mean, you might be onto something. And as is the case with lobsters, a lot of insects are covered in that hard shell, really like an armadillo, which is a mammal as well. So pain there does just not need to occur, which leads people to say they can't feel any pain, but that doesn't mean there isn't some type of sensing ability underneath that, sensors for things like heat and on and on. Of course, that really depends on the type of species, whether they have a carapace or hard outer shell or not. And also I wanna mention this paper, partly because it has the great name of Minds Without Spines in the journal Animal Sentience. Now they appear to be advocating for the inclusion of invertebrates, these insects into ethics situations, saying, quote, the nearly wholesale exclusion of invertebrates with central nervous systems from bioethics and science policy is not justified by the current state of the evidence. This exclusion is likely driven in part by outdated evolutionary ideas, stereotypes about the rigid instinctual behaviors of small brained animals, cognitive biases that distort moral attitudes toward these deeply unfamiliar creatures and flawed strategies for managing scientific and moral uncertainty. That was a lot. So yeah, right now we have a situation where a lot of these animals, tiny bugs are already being farmed and they're being killed through things like freezing or grinding a familiar one. But uh, you know, we need to think about this. We should essentially act as if these tiny animals are capable of suffering because that would be the moral thing to do. And another ethical thought is, you know, eating insects could really rack up your total animal death tally. Yeah, I know they're insects and people just don't care about them as much. 
but a meal could mean like a hundred guaranteed deaths <laughs> as opposed to, you know, eating a vegan meal where, you know, there's probably some harvest death fraction down the line. Or of course, eating the classically larger animals directly causing their death. So yeah, not looking great. And there's also a term that I stumbled upon here when researching this topic, and that is ento-vegan, in other words, saying bug vegan. And it was framed as sort of another term like pescatarian, but I kind of have a little bit of a problem with it. And that is when we apply the term vegan to things that are, you know, it's just really paradoxical and doesn't actually have anything to do with people being vegan. You know, they're saying if you're vegan, accept eating bugs, you can be an ento vegan in the same way that somebody who is vegan except eating fish is a pescatarian. You know, they're not a pesca vegan. We should just call them an entitarian or something. In the end, environmentally and in terms of food security, feed conversion ratios, etc., eating insects is certainly a step better than eating the animals that we currently are, but not better than plants. For example, nut protein is often carbon negative. Not gonna happen with insects. And unless they are fed waste, which has some complications and could be used for composting anyway, it's very unlikely that the greenhouse gases are gonna be meaningfully better than meat, but we will see. And then in terms of health, you know, we have this industry already making some pretty bogus claims. And of course that really high cholesterol content of cricket flour and the high saturated fat content of insects generally not good for the heart. And finally, when we're talking about pain, I mean, it already is the case that highly sentient capable of feeling pain animals like pigs are being farmed currently. We really need to stop doing that. But we also at the same time don't need to be farming a ton of more animals that could be feeling pain. That is my position. So I think there's certainly an improvement over eating beef or cow flesh or whatever you want to call it for the environment and on and on. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to be eating them anytime soon. I'm going to be eating plants and having a really low carbon footprint. But I will say I did learn a lot researching this video. I hope you learned stuff too. And it wasn't all encompassing. So let me know if there were any points that I missed in the comments below. You guys always have good stuff to say and feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one.